kids are half the church. <laughs> All right, I want to open up in prayer and ask God to uh, bless our time in the Word today. God, thank you so much for this day and for this time we could come together and lift our hearts and our minds up to you. Thank you that we can worship freely, Lord. Thank you so much for all the work you do in our lives and and in our church, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to do more and more as we pay attention to you and obey you and and listen to what you have to teach us. God, I pray as we get into your word right now that um, that I would just disappear and that your word would come through clearly to each one of us. Help us to understand what our role is here and the things we need to do in order to be obedient and faithful to the things you've given us. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be uh, in a bunch of different places. How many of you do not have an outline in front of you today? Does anyone? Does everyone have an outline? Joel, you're the only one. <laughs> He's got one. All right. <laughs> you're welcome, Joel. Our right, story of a man who was shipwrecked. On a deserted island, he was a very industrious man and, and mechanical, and he knew carpentry among other many things. and uh, And he was stuck on this island for fifteen years. Fifteen years. Imagine uh, castaway. Is that what it was? Or stowaway? Castaway. And uh, finally, he was rescued, and the ship came by and uh, saw his, his signs for help he had put in uh, on the beach. And uh, the men get off the boat and onto a little rowboat and went onto the island. And, and they were amazed to see this man standing there and what looked like a, an entire mini city. And the 15 years that this man had been stuck on this island, he had built all kinds of things. And these men who were intrigued asked the man stranded on the island, Can you give us a tour? It looks like you've done amazing things here. He says, I'd love to give you a tour. So he started walking him through the town, and he had buildings here and, and roads here. And he said, uh, the first building I want to show you is my house. As you can see, I've got a, a three-bedroom estate with a basement and, and two floors and a two-car garage. And uh, over here, this is uh, the grocery store I built for myself, and, and I go there and, and do my shopping. And he took him down the street a little bit. I put a little post office here for myself. And then the men said, well, what are these two buildings right here? Oh, that's, uh, that's the first church I built, and, and uh, that's the second church I built. That's the church I used to go to. Oh, that killed at another church. Listen, <laughs> the point of that joke is, you guys weren't ready for a joke, were you? You thought I was going to get serious on you right away. I can tell jokes sometimes. The point of that joke is, conflict is everywhere. Do you know that? How many of you guys have had conflict in your life within the last year? Everybody has. Why is that? Because we're human. Even if you're a Christian and you love Jesus and you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to run into conflict. Did you know that? The Bible assumes that we as Christians are going to have conflict, listen, even with each other. Even with each other. God assumes we're going to butt heads with each other every once in a while. He assumes that we're going to maybe bicker a little bit, maybe have some disagreements, maybe not see eye to eye on things. You know, even Paul disagreed with some of the other disciples in the book of Acts. Did you know that? Now, how can these people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and, 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 and uh, they're the people who are getting the gospel out all over the world? The whole gospel depends on these 12 people and they're fighting with each other. Do you think God saw that coming? Well, he sure did. You know, the Bible gives us instructions as believers as to how to get through those times. How are we supposed to deal with conflict with other believers? If you've been married or married now, you 
understand conflict, right? If you're a happy man, you let your wife win the conflict. <laughs> if you're right, you're probably not happy. Am I right or happy, honey? You're both? Oh, good. That's a rare thing to do. You know, in the uh, last few years, we've been hearing more and more, I think, extreme cases of, of strange conflicts that ended in extreme violence for seemingly mundane things. Here are a few examples. In Orlando, a 48-year-old man was shot to death by his wife after a fight over the TV controls. In California, a man was stabbed to death by his girlfriend because he brought home a McDonald's ham, egg, and cheese bagel instead of two egg McMuffins that she'd asked for. Sounds like she was probably pregnant. Get it right, husbands. In Dallas, a 37-year-old man was beaten to death by his roommate after a fight over the thermostat setting in their house. In Maryland, a 15-year-old boy has been charged in the shooting death of a man who was playing reggae music on his car stereo. Apparently that kid really hates reggae music. You know, as Christians, we have times of conflict too, maybe with a neighbor that seems unbearable. Um... But you know, the kinds of conflict God gives us instructions about have mostly to do with conflicts with each other. Because we spend a lot of time with each other, or we're supposed to, aren't we? The people you spend time with the most are the people that you argue with the most invariably, which is kind of a sad thing, but it's a true thing also. Our church family are people that we're supposed to be close to, and all families fight. So how do you have a good one? How do you have a good fight? How do you disagree and not see eye to eye yet come in, come out the other end of it unscathed and maybe even loving each other more? Because that's what God's goal is for us when we have a conflict, when we don't see eye to eye. There are problems in churches in every church. Even the best churches in the world have problems in them. But we are commanded by God to keep the unity. In Ephesians 4.1 it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love that word, endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What's that mean? It means you're trying really hard to do it. It's not something that happens by accident. Do you think a group of people can get along unless they're actively focused and trying to do so? It's really hard to do, isn't it? Even best friends have times in their lives where they're fighting against each other. It's interesting to see how we react in certain, diff in certain situations. But the Bible in Ephesians 4 says that we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. It doesn't happen on accident. It doesn't happen if you're passive. Why? Because we all do a lot of things all the time. One of the things we do that get us in trouble is we talk. Our mouths get us in trouble probably more than anything in the world. You know, in James it says that if any man can control his tongue, he's got his whole body under control. His whole body is under control. He's talking about the power of the tongue. Our tongues can do incredible harm, incredible damage to each other. And if we don't purposely, purposely control that, we can't keep the bond of peace between each other. In Philippians 4, 1, 3, I'd like you to turn there if you're already there. Or if you're not there, you can listen. It says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved, I implore Eudia and I implore Sinchi to be of the same mind in the Lord. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I love this. Paul is writing to the Philippian church, and he's thinking about two particular ladies who are having problems with each other. Two particular ladies who are fighting. I want you to know, ladies, I'm not picking on you because 
the Apostle Paul plays mediator with guys in a couple of situations in the Bible too. I just, I guess, randomly picked this one. I don't know. But Paul has on his heart and on his mind when he's writing this church, and he, he names names. I haven't known you enough to name names. <laughs> we don't name names from the Paul, but don't worry. But Paul is naming names in this letter. And he says, I plead with these two ladies. I implore them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Wouldn't you love to know what they were fighting about? Wouldn't you? How many of you would love to know what they were fighting about? You bunch of gossips. <laughs> we just want to know, don't we? It doesn't matter what they were fighting about. They weren't getting along. Probably over something trivial. Paul doesn't even mention it specifically. He just said, I implore you to get along with each other. I implore you to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now this is an interesting thing because in their minds they weren't agreeing with each other. But he said, be of the same mind in the Lord. You see, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. If you set any two guys in this room together, and guys in this room in a different room together just by themselves, and they went over every point of, of every belief and politics and religion or whatever, you, you would never find two guys that agree with each other on everything ever. You would never find that. Right? You're not a thinking person if you agree with somebody else 100% of the time on everything. And these two women here weren't agreeing with each other, but Paul said, in the Lord, you need to be of the same mind. You need to have unity in the Lord. There are things in the Lord that transcend everything else that you can face in this life. The things that involve who God is and His love for us and His grace for us transcends every issue you might disagree with if you're obeying Him and if you're focused on Him. We're commanded to keep the the unity. Also, we're commanded to be on guard. In Hebrews 12, it says this, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Did you pay attention to that? Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. And without it, what's going to happen? You won't see the Lord. You cannot experience the Lord in your life if you have rifts between you and another believer that you haven't dealt with. The Bible commands us to deal with the divisions amongst ourselves and to do it in a certain way. The Bible gives us a very specific plan to handle conflict resolution. It's not something that we choose ourselves. It's not something that I make up. It's not something I get to choose out of many different psychologist books that have written on uh, uh, psychologists that have written on uh, conflict resolution. God gives us a way to deal with conflict resolution. And as a believer, if you're a Christian, you are under God's orders to follow these rules whenever you have a problem with somebody. You have to understand that. This isn't just my opinion here I'm giving you. This is God's instructions to you. If you name the name of Christ, you are under orders to handle every single person in your life in this way and particularly in this church. The first step is this, and you can fill in your blanks. If I miss a blank, feel free to holler out. And I'll, I'll tell you what the blank is. The first one is this, is evaluate yourself. This is the first step. When you have a situation with a person come up, the first thing you need to do is evaluate yourself. That's step number one all the time. Why do we have to evaluate ourselves? Because sometimes the problem's me. I have to make sure that I'm not the one that's doing the sinning or that's causing the strife. We have to ask ourselves a couple of questions first in evaluating ourselves. Where does this strife come from? Am I the source of it? Did I step on someone's toes? Did I say something that maybe offended somebody? Did I insult somebody without, mer- without uh, having a, a reason to? Well, there's not really a reason to insult people if you're a Christian. Am I the one causing this? In James 4... It says this, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? So what's he saying? He's saying you need to evaluate yourself because fighting and lust come from within inside of us. It's not necessarily an outside thing. Maybe the problem is me. And the problem is you and not the other person. Well, that's where you need to start. In Ephesians 4, 26, it says this, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, 
neither give place to the devil. The first thing you need, uh, another thing you need to ask is this. Am I in the right? Am I in the right? You may be in the right. Do you know that you may be correct and still be in a conflict? But probably 98% of people in a conflict think that they're the ones that are correct. <laughs> I think in reality, uh, usually both people share the blame a little bit. In most cases. But it says, be angry and sin not. That's a weird command. I've never heard, or have you ever heard, God command us to be angry? Isn't that a weird, weirdly phrased verse? Some people uh, have a problem with the verse that describes God as jealous. They say that sounds really contradictory to God's nature to be someone who's jealous. Isn't that a sin? Well, not in the way it's speaking about God. He's speaking about God's love for us, his jealousy over us. And this verse is saying, in your anger, don't sin. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying there's a lot of things in life to be angry about. There's a lot of things in life that we can get upset about and hot under, under the collar about. When you have a conflict with somebody in the church, you might get angry. You might get rightfully so. But he says, in the middle of your anger, don't sin. Don't let your anger cause you to make a sinful choice. In your anger, don't attack somebody. Don't try to tear somebody down. Don't let something unwholesome come out of your mouth. In your anger, don't sin. So am I in the right? If you are, make sure you don't sin because of the anger that's going on. And he gives these next instructions. Don't even let the sun go down on your wrath because it gives place for the devil in your life. Some people let problems fester and fester and fester. Now, this is true in marriages too. If you have a problem with your spouse and you just let it fester and fester and fester and fester, well, eventually that's going to blow up. That's like shaking a pop bottle. The sooner you deal with a problem, the better you're going to be in that relationship. The next thing is this. Oh, I'm sorry, and you're blank. Does this really need addressed, or am I just overreacting? That's something we need to ask too. You know, the Bible talks about how we're supposed to confront people, and we're going to get into that into a second. But sometimes, maybe that's not the best thing. We've got to evaluate the situation. Sometimes if you're just overreacting, going to confront somebody may make things worse. So it's not always the default situation. You've got to make sure it's, you have a biblical reason to go and confront somebody and take care of the problem. <clears throat> Next thing is this. Keep the problem between yourself and the person that you have a problem with. I cannot overemphasize this point. One of my uh, favorite pastors in this country has a, uh, a system that he takes new members in his church through. And every month when he does the, the, new, the new members welcome, and he has them all come up forward for the vote, he takes them aside and he explains to them what it means to be a member in, in, in their church. And he puts them all under a promise to each other in the church. And they promise to each other right there as they're becoming members that they will not back talk, that they will not gossip, that they will not say things that tear other people down. And they understand from day one, from day one what their attitude towards other people and towards problems they might face in the church is to be. They are to handle things in a godly and a loving way. It doesn't mean that you don't try to handle a problem, but that we do it in a biblical way. Keep the problem between yourself and the person you have the problem with. That's step one. Do you know how difficult this is sometimes? Especially with Facebook. This is one of the reasons I don't go on Facebook so much. It kind of... I don't have a problem. If you're on Facebook, that's fine. I don't, I don't care. But there's, people talk about so much. Even on Facebook, I, I'm amazed. As a pastor uh, at, at my old church, I can, I can, I can name names. Uh, but people post public things. You know, that, that you just think, why would you put that in, in public? You know, you, you, you friended your pastor on Facebook. Your pastor's looking at this, you know, whether it's beer bottles or, or you know, people are getting uh, uh, tattoos or out partying or, or, or whatever. It's just people post it on Facebook and it's like they forgot they, they friended their pastor. It's weird. 
that people are so open about just things and fights that they have in between people. But we need to keep the problem first between myself and the person I have the problem with. I heard of four pastors that went camping. And uh, they were sitting around the, the campfire and they were talking with each other and they said, you know what, brothers? We're here away from our flocks and, and there's not a soul to hear what we're talking about. And I, I kind of want to challenge you guys and I'm just a little bit curious myself. What, what is maybe a big deep dark sin that you deal with in your life and uh, he said I'll, I'll, I'll start first I'll be the first one to go I, you know every, every couple of weeks I like to go down to the, to the horse tracks and, and lay some money down on my favorite horse my problems gambling that's, that's what I, I struggle with when I'm away from everybody the next pastor said oh alright I'll, I'll confess I guess uh, my, my thing I struggle with is, is my temper I get really mad and I yell at my wife and uh, probably a lot more than I should. And then the next guy, the next pastor said, well, since you guys are, are sharing, I, I guess I might as well tell you, I keep a lot of bottles of gin under my mattress at home. And boy, when me and my deacons get into it at church, uh, I just go home and, and I open up those bottles and just drown myself. So my problem is my problems with alcohol. And... Uh, the last pastor was just sitting there. His eyes were wide open. And the other pastors were looking at him. And they were thinking, well, what's in this guy? He said, what, what, what's, what's your problem? Why, you, why do you look so tense over there? And he said, well, brothers, my, my problem's gossiping. And I can't wait to get back to share all these things with your flock. <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32, it says this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Repeat with me. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. God gave our mouths to us and our tongues to us to edify other people. When I was a youth pastor, I had a sermon titled, titled uh, sarcastically or ironically, Edify Stupid. Teenagers are horrible at edifying each other. Edify, stupid. And that really stuck in their heads. But we're supposed to only let words come out of our mouth that edify. Listen to the purpose of a language that God's given us our tongues for. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. This is the reason God's given us language. This is the reason he's given us relationships with each other. So that when we open our mouth, it might build somebody up. And minister grace unto the hearers. And he says in verse 30, if you don't do that, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. <coughs> when we let things come out of our mouth that tear people down instead of build people up. The Bible says that you are grieving the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? It means that you are crushing his heart. You're causing him sorrow in your life. The Bible says that if you're a Christian, that the Holy Spirit has made his home inside of you. You belong to Christ. You're his temple. And when you sin against God, it, 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 what happens is, is the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you when you sin against God. When we sin against God as, as Christians, he stays right there because he's indwelling us. You're his, your heart's his home. And so when we sin, because he doesn't leave us, we're dragging him through that sin. And the Bible says that, his, that the Spirit is grieved. The Holy Spirit is grieved because he wants us to live holy lives. He's working in us all the time to make us more and more like Christ. And so it says, instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. You listen to that? Church, these are not suggestions. These are commands. You are under God's command to use your tongue in a way that is upbuilding to one another. And uh, you know where I'm talking with a lot of the deacons and leaders in the church about how we're going to organize our discipleship process here. and We're thinking about, you know, how to rearrange our new believers' classes and new members' classes. And I thought, you know, do I need to... 
when new members come in, put everyone under a, a promise that they promise to each other not to speak this way, you, you know what? I don't think I do because we're already under that. If you're a Christian, we're obligated to obey this. We don't need to make a new vow, a new promise to each other. I'm obligated to obey God's word, to let no corrupt communication proceed out of my mouth. Listen to Proverbs 17, 9. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Someone once said that uh, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth even has its pants on in the morning. And how true that is. You know, gossip can be true things also. Not all gossip is lies. You can be spreading gossip and the thing you're sharing is true. You know, one of my favorite forms of gossip is, is when a group of Christians are together, maybe at a Bible study, and, and there's, there's always maybe one or two gossipers in a crowd, and they just can't wait to share the dirt on somebody in the form of a prayer request. Oh, sisters, or oh, brother, you got to pray for so-and-so. I found out on Facebook or whatever that they're doing this and this and this. Listen, there's all different kinds of ways for people to gossip. But repeating things that you hear to everybody that you run across separates close friends. Some people see gossip as, as some kind of power, some form of power. I know this bit of information. My friends don't know or my circle doesn't know. I'm going to be the center of attention in sharing this. You know, someone who gossips is focused on being the center of attention. They're being selfish. If you're a gossip, you need to get into a right relationship with God. Because you're somebody who separates people who are friends. In Proverbs 26, 20, it says this, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. In Proverbs 30, 33, says, For as churning the milk produces butter... And as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring anger produces strife. And I want you to listen to me. If you know a gossiper, I want you to know that it's just as sinful to sit there and listen to gossip when someone begins talking to you. You're, you're sharing equally in that sin of gossip. Listening to gossip or complaints about other people is just as bad as speaking it yourself. We need to be careful what comes out of our mouths. So what do we do if we're in a conflict, if we're in a situation, we've evaluated ourselves, and I haven't spread the problem to other people that have nothing to do with the problem. What do I do then? Here's how you choose to confront or not confront. When do you take the initiative? When do you realize that action needs to be taken in a conflict with another person? <coughs> Here are some points to know when you should take action. The first one is this. I sense bitterness growing with me or the person involved. If you sense bitterness growing, and the, one of the verses we read just said, don't let bitterness take root. Bitterness can destroy a church. It can destroy your relationships with your brothers and sisters. We cannot allow bitterness to take root, and we need to be vigilant to not do that. But if you sense bitterness growing between you and the person involved, Maybe during the handshaking time, you kind of avoid one side of the aisle. I don't know. We need to be vigilant not to let bitterness... Think. So if you sense bitterness growing between you and somebody, don't let it fester. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. If you know there's bitterness there with you and that person. Uh, you know, sometimes we can be paranoid too, though. Sometimes it can just be something I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, but that's not really there. Have you ever been in that situation? But if you know the other person's dealing with it too, we need to take the initiative. My fellowship with this person cannot be repaired without it. That's number two. If I have broken fellowship with somebody and there's no way for our fellowship to be repaired except for me confronting it, then I need to take the initiative. The third thing is this. The issue at hand has spread beyond me and the person involved. This is a danger zone. This is red lights going off in your head. If the problem between you and another person has spread and other people are, know about it and other people sense it, then it's gone beyond you. You are under obligation to take the initiative to confront. 
I want you to pay attention to this. There's a price to not confronting. Many of us shy away from this kind of open confrontation. It's not comfortable to confront somebody, whether you're the one who did the wrong or whether you're the, wrong, the one who was wronged. It's not a comfortable thing to do. We don't like to confess our sins to other people. We don't like to, you know, I think even most normal people don't like just getting into fights for no reason. So people will let that thing fester. But, you know, we should have learned years ago that the first price you pay is always the cheapest. If you wait and wait and wait, the price you pay will be a lot higher. These things just get worse and worse. The truth might hurt, but it's always more satisfying in the end to get it done with soon. And it costs you a lot less. So I want you to pay attention on your, on your outline. Who goes first? <clears throat> Who goes first, biblically? Who's supposed to be the one that takes the step? Here we go, Matthew 5, 23-24. Listen to it carefully. I'm going to ask you a question. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. So who goes first according to this verse? The person who sinned or the person who was sinned against? Who? In this verse, it was the person who sinned. It says, if you remember that thy brother hath ought against thee. Thy brother has a reason against you. You're the person that did the wrong. You know you did wrong to your brother. So the person who goes first is the person who sins. Oh, on your blank, the person who sins is to go first. Now, Matthew 18. Listen carefully to this. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Did he pay attention? Who goes first in this verse? Yeah, in this verse, the person sinned against goes first. So, and your outline is there. Both outlines are first. Listen, who goes first? Who goes first? God has put the initiative on each one of us to be the first one to go, no matter what. Whether you're the one sinned against or you're the one that sins. We're under obligation. Here's who goes first. Let me tell you, ready for this? The person who loves Jesus the most is going to go first. Does that make it clear for you? Whoever loves Jesus Christ the most and wants to have unity with his brother and sister, the person who's the most spiritual between the two is the person who will go first. That's the person that will take the step. God puts the onus on each one of us. When you see a rift... When you see a break in fellowship, it is your responsibility, it is my responsibility, each one of us are told to go first. You don't wait for the other person. Well, that's not fair. It doesn't matter. What if God treated you fairly? What do you think your life would be like if you got what you deserved? Do you think it would be any fun? It wouldn't be fun at all. God doesn't treat us like we deserve. He treats us like He loves us. And He expects us to treat our brothers and sisters in the same way. God took the initiative to make the relationship, His relationship with you right. Even though you had no right for Him to even do that. He took the initiative in your salvation. In saving your soul from hell, He took the first step. He took every step. He did everything that was needed. All He asks for you is to repent and believe so that you can get to heaven. But he initiated the whole process. Jesus' command for us is to take the initiative. And he's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done. The difference between a spiritual and an unspiritual community is not whether conflict exists, but what their perception of that conflict is and what their attitude is and the, their approach and their handling of conflict. Listen to this, Ephesians 4. I, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk Worthy of the vocation where you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
And listen, here's a point over there under number three. If needed, take a mediator. Take a mediator. That's what this verse says in Matthew. You go to the person alone. If that person won't listen to you, then you go get another brother. You try to keep it as quiet as possible. You don't let the whole world know. Go and get another brother. And then let that person try to be a mediator, not listen. You have to be care- very careful who you choose as a mediator if, the, if you're in this situation. Here are some points to remember when you're choosing a mediator, okay? The first thing is this. When you're choosing a mediator, you need to make sure that person is spiritually mature and trustworthy. Make sure they're spiritually mature and trustworthy on your blank. The next one is this. is Choose somebody as a mediator who's not personally vested in the problem. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers. This person's goal must be restoration. It must be restoration. The next point is this. Go with the Holy Spirit's leading and in the proper attitude. This includes going to listen and being open to the other's words. The Bible says we need to be quick to and slow to. Oh, how much trouble will that save us in life? It's our mouth that gets us in so much trouble. I've learned after 15 years of marriage to just keep my mouth zipped. And things go really smooth sometimes, right? We have to be careful to let the things that come to, to choose the things that come out of our mouth carefully. Now listen, Proverbs 10, 19 says, When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. Oh, this is great marriage advice. Listen, there's all kinds of verses about speaking and talking that the Bible gives us. And if you're walking in the Holy Spirit, this is what happens. God reminds us of truth in the Bible when we're in situations. These are awesome verses to memorize. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Proverbs 12, 18, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers. Be compassionate as humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Listen, God gives us instructions about how to get through conflicts that we deal with in life. Proverbs 15 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If we're walking in the Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit causes us to do? The Holy Spirit causes us to obey the Bible. That's what he does. I can't wait to start doing a series on the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit that much as Baptists. Do you know that? I can't remember how many sermons I've heard on just the topic of the Holy Spirit. It's such an important... You cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? Some people think the Holy Spirit makes you do weird things. I'm already weird. I don't need that. (laughs) The Holy Spirit causes us to obey Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit causes us to obey the Bible. If you see someone blaming the Holy Spirit for something they're doing, always check the Bible. If they're doing something against what the Bible says or outside of what the Bible says, you you need to question that. The Word is always first. All right? Jesus Christ is the Word. He's the Word. And if the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ inside of you, the Holy Spirit is not going to direct you to do something the Bible doesn't tell you to do. I'm getting on a whole different sermon. I better stop. But if you're walking in the Spirit, all right, He's going to teach you how to watch your tongue. He's going to teach you how to deal with people and how to love people. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches you to love. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit will increase your emotional IQ. Do you know what that is? You've heard of uh, your intellectual IQ. There's an EQ, your emotional... My IQ is low, but... I forgot what the cue is and the, and the quotient. Yeah, quotient. My emotional, my EQ is, is way, it's off the charts, but my IQ is really low. Now listen, the Holy Spirit will help you in navigating situations like this. He will make you sensitive to the other person's need. When you love someone, you're putting someone else first. Your goal is the restoration of that relationship. Now watch, here's number five. Love must rule. The, obje- the objective is always restoration. When you confront somebody, you're not confronting somebody in order to vent. You're not confronting somebody in order to put someone in their place. We confront when necessary 
in order to restore relationships. Restoration. Reconciliation. That is the goal when we follow God's path when we're in a conflict. Number five, love must rule. Listen, you have heard that it has been said in Matthew 5, verse 43, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why does Jesus ask us to love our enemies? Because we were his enemies and he loved us. He loved us. Why can Christians not get along? Listen, I'm going to tell you a story about one of my favorite things that ever happened in life. You guys know I love people. I love everybody. I really do. I love everybody. And uh, one of my favorite things to do, and I, I, I do that here, but at my old church, I, I would shake everybody's hands. It was my goal to meet everybody that came in the door. And then one day, this lady named Barb came to church. She's an older lady. And uh, first time I saw her, it's right before service, church service. And uh, I saw her, and she grabbed my attention because she was looking at me with the meanest, foulest scowl that had ever been cast upon another human being. This person had the evil eye on me. And I had never even met her before. And I would come into church week after week for a few weeks. And every time I walked into the building, there was Barb. And then it got so bad that even once, once everyone was sitting down in their seats, in their pews, just like this, I would be sitting in the back and Barb would be like, <laughs> right at me. And I was so confused, I'd never even spoken to this person before. But she hated me with such an intense hatred. In fact, her, her hatred was so deep for me that I was drawn to her. It was intriguing. I told you, I'm sick in the head, right? I said, God, what do I do? I don't know, even know what I did to this person. Help me to love this person. This person was the mom of one of our best friends. <laughs> I said, God, help me love her. And so I started coming to the church. The next week I came and I said, Barb, how you doing? It's so good to see you. And I grabbed her hand. She wasn't sticking it out. She was just scowling at me. I was shaking her hand. I'm so glad to see you. Thanks for coming to church. Hope you have a wonderful service. And I just backed away and was waiting for something to hit the back of my head. And I came in the next week. Barb, it's so good to see you. Thanks for coming to church. I'm glad you're here. Scow. Oh, you've never seen a scow makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. I did that for a year. And then one Sunday I went in. <laughs> and she saw me and started walking towards me with just a straight face. <laughs> Usually I'm the one going up to her. And she opened her arms up. She hugged me. Oh, you've never been hugged like that. Every Sunday after that, she just hugged me. I, I don't know why she hated me to this day. She asked me before she died if I would do her funeral for her. It happened just a year after I started getting hugs. <laughs> God's love and grace changes people's lives. If you know his love, then you know how to love your enemies. If you know his grace, then you know how to exercise grace towards other people. God's grace gives us what we need to be the people God's called us to be. To show love to people that even hate us. That's our standard, is to love people that hate us. God wants to use you. He wants to use me, but we've got to get right with him. You can't be wrong with another brother or sister and be right with God. Because the Bible says you leave your gift at the altar and get right with your brother and sister. Why are you supposed to leave your gift at the altar? Because you can't worship God until you're right with your brother and sister. You can't. He doesn't accept it. Does that sound harsh? 
That's what the Bible says. Because that's his standard for us. You can't be walking in his love if you hate your brother and sister. You can't say you know him if you hate your brother and sister. It's contradictory. Of my, my little girl, my nine-year-old. <laughs> my favorite thing is tucking her, tucking her in at night. And boy, we have some deep theological conversations. We had another great one last week. She came up and she was just really upset. She had been getting in trouble all day. Because of how she treats one of her little brothers. He gets on her nerves. Mine too sometimes. <laughs> She was getting in trouble, and she was just upset when I went up to, to tuck her in. And she was just, she was just mad. I said, "Look, you, you you've got to soften up on, on your brother. You can't you can't just act out however you want. When you feel angry, you can't just smack him or whatever it is that's on your mind. You can't do that." I said, "God calls us to love people, even when they're being like that." And uh, he he said, "I know he does, but." Dad, he just deserves it every time. <laughs> I said, this is a dad moment here. I, I'm being tested. Uh, <laughs> I realized she needed to have grace towards her brother. And I thought, you know, I, 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 I'm a preacher. And if I can't explain grace to a nine-year-old, I, I don't know how good I am. Um, so I thought about it for a minute. I didn't know exactly how to word it. And it came to my head. I said, Elena, what would I deserve if I punched you in the face? And she didn't have to think about it. You deserve to be punched in the face. <laughs> my kids are fighters. <laughs> I said, you're right. I would deserve to be punched in the face. That's eye for an eye, right? That's the biblical model of justice equality. It's eye for an eye. I said, That's what I would deserve. What would you get if God gave you everything you deserved for all the sins that you've done? You know, instead of giving us what we deserve, Jesus had nails put through his hands and, and, and a crown of thorns put on his head. And she just started crying. Because she, she's saved. She knows, she knows God. She still struggles with treating her brother right. But she understood grace. She knew that she doesn't get what she deserves. And that she needs to treat her brother with grace too, even though it's hard sometimes. Church, listen, if a nine-year-old can understand grace, how much more the church of God? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. first people I want to talk to is the church. Talked last week about the body of Christ and what it meant to be part of the body that we take care of each other and we react when another part of the body is hurting. Well, this is specific instructions to that message last week. And I want you to be very attentive to what the Holy Spirit's telling you in your life. I want you to search your heart and search your mind. Allow the Lord to search your heart and mind. But if you have a brother or sister in this church or outside of this church that you have a conflict with, I want you to know that that affects your relationship with God. That affects your prayers. If the Holy Spirit's bringing someone to your mind that you need to get right with. You know what to do. You've heard the instructions. Don't let it fester any longer. Go and get forgiveness. Go and make it right. Even if you were the one wronged against. Or if you were the one who wronged. It doesn't matter. You're told to go first. The Lord's speaking to you about Somebody specifically. I want to ask you to respond to this message. And when the music starts, you can come down and, and deal with the Lord and maybe reach across the aisle to that person that you still have something against or that has something against you. Guys, we need to live in grace. Oh, there's so much grace. 
It never runs out. His grace never stops. And we need to live in it. If you're in this room today and you're not a Christian, I want you to know, listen, there's no Christian in this world that's perfect. That might be a comforting thing to know if you're considering becoming one. Listen, Jesus died for you because you're a sinner. He died for you so that he didn't have to give you what you deserved. He died for you so that he could give you what you needed, salvation and forgiveness. He had to pay that price. He took the hits for you. He became your sacrifice and died for your sins. The Bible says you need to repent and turn to Christ for forgiveness. If you don't repent and turn to Christ, there's no other way for you to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to God except through him. It's not through church and being moral. If you know you need to get saved, I want to challenge you. When the music starts to step out and come forward, to bow here at the altar, at the front pew, and you'll have a brother or sister here in this church come and pray with you. I want you to stand to your feet as the music plays. I want you to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about today.